Greetings, friends. It is another episode of Cal Preach, and I am sitting here with my queen, Queen Pokey. Uh, we're going to talk about some really heavy stuff today. Uh, but before we get into the heavy, 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 I want to just tell you that I've been having a little bit of um, sadness around um, Billy not being completely, you know, saved. If there's such thing as not being completely saved, could he be partly saved? Could, could Billy be partly saved? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't think so. Um, but I just feel like a snail's going to jog before he's going to become saved. And I really just have to like turn that over today because it's not a good feeling of just feeling like when is he coming? And I know that I have all of you guys praying for my beautiful man. Um, I love my husband. I'm not going anywhere. I mean, you know, the Bible says to be an example and to... You know, just by your gentleness, just by my kindness, just by my patience, that his heart will be won over for Christ. So, amen. I'm just trusting in that today. I'm just going to trust in that today because what other choice do I have? I've got no other choice. Um, and I'm thinking about, I've got my holy notes here today because, you know, I am in a little bit of an, en an enigma. That's a hard word to say today. An enigma to my husband I'm a bit of an enigma, of an enigma. I'm a bit of an enigma <laughs> to my husband. And I am. I am. He's like, you're not the same person I married. And I'm like, you're right. I'm not. And I'm sorry, but I'm not going to apologize that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And, you know, that I live for him now and that he is the center of my life. You know, I, I, I put Jesus first and you're second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, no guy wants to hear that he's that he's second. And I don't think that, you know, I necessarily need to repeat that over and over because it's not actually very um relationship building, but uh no man wants to compete with Jesus. Um but it is the truth. I mean, Jesus comes first and then um and then Bill. Uh do I, should I come before Billy? Like, kind of feel like I should come before Billy. You know, me. Because I, if I don't put myself first, I can't really take care of other people. Or is that like a new agey thing? Somebody comment for me. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I, um, I just feel like I have changed so much since he met me when I was 23 and I'm just a different, I'm just a completely different person. I mean, even if I hadn't gotten saved, when you meet somebody when you're 23 and now you're 52, you're just not the same person. You have to grow and change and, and, and adopt, you know, to each, ad adapt, adopt, adapt to each other's, um, growth and changes in life. And, um, that's something that we're, we're working on in our marriage. You know, we're growing together, we're learning together, but, um, it's a weird phase. It's just a weird phase. The kids are going to be out of the house soon. And like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The two of us are going to travel. We say we're going to travel. We say we're going to um, yeah, <laughs> I have no idea what we're going to do. Cause like, I'm not even a huge travel bug. Like I know there's tons of people out there that love to travel. Um, I don't, I feel like there's something on the screen. I just want to wipe it down once. Hold on. just want to make sure. No, I think it was fine. Um, anyway, uh, the marriage thing. The marriage thing. Can I get a holla? Um, okay, so I have a holy note here for you, and then we're going to get into what I really wanted to discuss with you, which is a little deep, but I think it's important. I'm going to share it with you. The Holy Spirit is like a deep sea diver, exploring the depths of our soul, bringing things up to the surface so we can examine them, understand them, familiarize ourselves with the things that have been buried so deep. 
So the Holy Spirit's job, part of the Holy Spirit's job, is to uh, navigate the deepest, most innermost chambers of our heart and our soul and to bring to the surface the uh, things that we are either unwilling to examine or never knew we needed to examine. And that process can be very painful, but it can also be extremely liberating and ultimately, you know, brings us closer to our creator because, um, yeah, no pain, no gain. But I loved that analogy of the deep sea diver and him just diving into the deepest depths of our soul. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit and the Holy Bible are like brother and sister, blood related. Through the blood of Christ, the Holy Bible and the Holy Spirit are blood related. They are related like brother and sister. And, <clears throat> you know, I was thinking about the power of words because Billy and I both said some words to each other uh, over the past 48 hours that probably would have been better left unsaid. Words are powerful, and the Bible says that the tongue is like a double-edged sword, um, you know, that poison and beauty can both come out of the tongue, um, and that it's the hardest thing to tame is the tongue, and boy, is that true. Um, yeah, I basically told Billy that um, I was frustrated with him and that I felt like um, he didn't get me and that I was nervous and anxious that if I continue to grow in my spiritual walk, which he kind of has, you know, sort of no interest in, I mean, he does the chilies and he loves doing the chilies, but he's really not in a place where he's really wanting to explore God right now. He's just not. But I know that you guys are all praying for him and I'm praying for him. But I want to say that um, words can really, really hurt. But think about words for a second. Think about the fact that we think in words. I mean, our thoughts are formulated in words. I mean, you can't, you can't think a thought without saying words in your head. Even if it's an unconscious thing, you're formulating your thoughts through words. If we didn't have words to formulate, formulate our thoughts, they would just be like vast canvases. Our thoughts would be vast canvases of nothingness. So our words, uh, communicate things to make people understand what we're trying to say or not misunderstand what we're trying to say. And um, the Lord chose to express himself through words, through the Bible. He, cho he chose to reveal his truth and himself literally through words. And then the word became flesh. So words, you guys, are everything. Look at this. Look at that. And if you can look really carefully, there's a, I don't think you'll be able to tell, but there's one of those like sky people with an, um, with an umbrella. <laughs> what are they called? <laughs> He's floating around up there over the mountain. I have no idea. Uh, oh gosh, I still have COVID brain. Anyway, an umbrella, really China? Okay. So lastly, before I get into my little story, um, oh, that is, oh, no, no, hold on. Sorry, not trying to make you nauseous here. Um, God does not reveal his holy word to the wise and prideful. He conceals and shrouds it. It is only for those that come to him like little children. So let's just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that my wonderful, beautiful, lovely husband will be able to come to the Lord like a little child. And hopefully it won't take too much pain uh, to get him 
to that place in his walk with God. Hopefully it can be a smooth trans transition for him because, um, you know, it can hurt. It can hurt when we come to the Lord because a lot of people have to get there through a lot of pain and a lot of challenge and a lot of obstacles and a lot of, uh, you know, just uh, heartbreak. Sometimes it takes a lot of heartbreak. So let's play that, pray that that's not his story. So I'm going to tell you now um, what has been um, on my heart. You know, <clears throat> God, he pursues us. God pursues us. But uh, when, we're, um, when we're children or even when we're not children, there's something called a predator. And... Um, I had an experience with a predator. He was pursuing me, <laughs> but he was a predator. And uh, I'll tell you the story real quick. I was in a Taco Bell. That's how it all started. I was in a Taco Bell when I was about 14 and I was sitting with my two really good friends and these other girls walked in who I knew just sort of on the periphery. I didn't really hang out with these girls very often, but I did know them. And I knew they were kind of street girls. You know, they were very street wise, very street savvy. And um, they sat at the table next to us and they said, so um, are you guys interested in um, going over to a friend of ours house. It's really fun. He's got a pool. He's got video games. He orders pizzas and he sometimes takes us shopping. And I was like, what's the catch? And they were like, there's no catch. It's just this guy that wants to, you know, hang out and have some fun. And, um, he's got pot. And, um, I thought, there's got, there's got to be something more to this. And um, they said, we're telling you, there's nothing more to it. Just come check it out. It's really fun. So the following week, me and my friends, we took the bus down to um, Marina Del Rey. And we, I should have known, Marina Del Rey was filled with people that were just not cool. Um <laughs> <laughs> just, I don't know how else to explain it. Creepy, like creepy. Um, so anyhow, I took the bus down there with a friend or two and we got to this guy's house. We'll call him George. And, um, we got to George, George's house and he, um, yeah, he had pizzas delivered and we were playing video games and we were having a blast and, you know, we passed a joint and we were smoking. And um, remember, I'm 14. And um, later that night, he took us to the movies. And we, uh, we uh, came back and slept there, sl stayed the night. Uh, I slept on the couch. The next morning, we left. Everything was fine. The following weekend these girls called us back up and they're like, do you want to go back over to George's? And we were like, sure, it was fun. So we went back to George's place and it was another great weekend. This time he took us out, he took us shopping. We bought some dolphin shorts. I don't know if anyone remembers those dolphin shorts, some vans. Oh my gosh, I was so excited. I was like, this guy's cool. Like this guy is really, really fun. Hi, peace of Christ. So the third weekend, we go back again and I'm playing video games and uh, just sitting there, I just had dinner and my friend, my friend said to me, oh, George wants to know if you'll go back into the back room. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. So I go into the back room and there's George with no pants on. And he's sitting with the two other girls from Taco Bell that I didn't know that well. 
and um, they are partially undressed. And I was like, uh, what's going on? And he was like, I just wanted to let you know that if you want to move on to the next tier and become part of the family that um, this is what you're gonna need to do. And he proceeded to uh, yeah, he proceeded to have sex with these two other girls who were a little bit older than me, not much. Well, I, uh, I, I left the room and I uh, went and turned to my closest girlfriend. And I said, this is, this is not good, we're in trouble. And she said, no, don't worry about it. Like, he's such a cool guy. Everything's going to be fine. Look at how much fun we're having. And we proceeded to, like, open a six-pack of beer. And I just didn't even give it an another thought. So then the following week, I got a phone call from George. And he said, hey, I really want you to come over again. And I said, well, I have no way of getting there. I can't take the bus. Um... And he said, no, 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 I'll come pick you up. And I thought, well, how are you gonna do that? My mom's home. And he was like, don't worry, I'll bring my niece and we'll tell your mom that that's my daughter. So he uh, comes over in his brown Cadillac and he knocks on the door. His niece is there, she's probably about 10. I'd never met her before. And he, uh, my mom answers the door and she says, oh, hi. And he says, oh, hey, I'm George and um, I'm Carrie's mom and I'm here to take China on uh, her sleepover. And I'm sure my mom thought it was a bit strange that I was having a sleepover with like a 10 or an 11 year old when I was 14 but she kind of let it slide. And she was like, oh, fantastic, China, come on, honey. George is here. And I had my little backpack and I jumped in the car, said, bye, mom, love you, bye. So I get in the car and we drive back to his house. And to my relief, there were like four other girls there. I thought, oh no, I'm trapped with just George. But there were some other girls there. So um, I, I uh, got, got to the house and yeah, we you know broke open some beers and we went for a swim and then we went out to lunch and then we got back to the house. And um, he said, hey, let's go into the back room. I knew what the back room meant. It was his master bedroom and that was never good news. So we go back into his room and he's like, everybody just lay down. Oh, his niece was gone now. So I don't know how, who picked her up, probably her mother, but she wasn't there anymore. And um, he told us to lay down on the bed and I'm not gonna get too descriptive because it's not appropriate for California dreaming. I mean, preaching, but um, let's just say that without having intercourse, he did other things to us. So um, I walked away from that day just feeling really numb and really scared and suddenly very trapped because what I failed to mention was a couple of times before I had gone there, I'd gone there and he had exhibited, he would sometimes leave us there for the entire day. He'd go to work and we would just play video games and swim and order food in and smoke pot and drink. And then he'd come home at around five and spend the evenings with us, take us to dinner, take us bowling, take us to the movies. And um, I just remember one night he came home and we hadn't washed the dishes, we just left like a pile of dishes in the sink and he flipped out and he really like 
turned into a different person and he was just raging at us and screaming and saying, you know, you had all day to clean these freaking dishes and, you know, what's wrong with you guys and you take advantage of me. <laughs> yeah, the irony. Um, and so, so I was kind of scared of this guy, you know? Um, but anyways, that night I went to sleep and I was laying on the couch in the living room and he came into the living room and got on the couch with me and let's just say that without having intercourse um he was rubbing against me and i just prayed to god and i said god please don't let him do anything more don't let him do anything more please i mean please god and he didn't, thank you, Jesus, do anything more. I mean, that was bad enough. And then he got up and went back into his bedroom. And I just remember laying on the couch crying and thinking, how am I going to get myself out of this situation? I'm stuck. And I felt terrified. So a couple of days later at home, a couple of my girlfriends, I called a couple of my girlfriends and I said, guys, you got to come over. We got to talk we can't go there anymore. And they were like, I know you're right. This is bad. He's a bad person. He's going to do this to other people. Maybe we should call the authorities. And then I was like, no, my mom can't find out. She'll kill me. And, um, the girl, a couple of the other girls felt the same way. Like, I, you know, my parents can never find out. I'll never be forgiven. I'll be sent away to boarding school. So, uh, oh, the most beautiful bird just flew over us. Um, so, so we didn't do anything about it, but we just stopped going over there. And, um, and, and then about cut to, oh, gosh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 20, yeah, 10 years later, 10 years later, I'm at Tower Records doing a Wilson Phillips signing. And there's thousands of people at Tower Records on Sunset. It's, it was a, you know, a record store, which don't exist anymore, but it was a record store. Very famous one on Sunset Boulevard. And I'm signing away and I'm smiling. And I'm having a great time. I'm signing all these autog autographs and I've got Carney and Wendy right next to me. And there's just a line out the door um, and down the block. And Suddenly, I'm just signing something, and he says, yeah, make it out to Bob and say, I love you, Bob. And I look up. Sure enough, it's him. And <clears throat> I, um, I don't even remember. I went into a blackout, and I handed him back the CD. And um, he took the CD, and he went, <laughs> and he gave me this little sly half smile, and he walked away. And Carney turns to me and she goes, isn't everybody here just so nice? And I turned to her and I said, Carney, that man that was just here, the one that just had me sign his, uh, um, his CD, that's, that's the guy. Because I told her about it. I said, that's the guy that was the predator um, when I was 14. And she was like, no. I said, yeah. And I turned to the security guards and I said, do me a favor, that man that just walked out, do not let him back in. Make sure that man does not come back in. So um, I was driving a few months later down Pico Boulevard and this guy in a convertible pulls up right alongside me and makes sure I'm looking at him and he just waves and it's him and he drives off. That was the last time I ever saw George. But um, I just wanted to share this story with you guys because, you know, I know you guys are probably thinking like, oh my gravy, China has all these horrible, horrible stories about her childhood. And you know what? I do. I do have some pretty sad, sad stories and I'm going to tell another one next month. But there are predators out there, real predators. I've been a victim of it. And it's a miracle that I ever let my children have a sleepover ever at anyone's house. But, um, you know, I know that all of those experiences molded me into who I am today. And that 
that God turned those bad things into good, that I'm able to share them with other people and that I'm able to show you that I was able to get through that and that I was able to, um, I mean, somebody said to me yesterday, China, how are you still standing? How are you still standing? And, you know, my only answer is God. I just feel like God had his hand on me. And you know what? There are people who don't, who don't make it. There are people who literally die in the hands of their predators. And um, I'm just so grateful to God that that's not my story. But if this story could help just one person out there who has had a similar experience, I just um, wanted to let you know that you're not alone and that, you know, um, these, these wicked people who are out there, you know, God have mercy on their souls, um, you know, need to be stopped, need to be stopped and um, protecting our children from this happening to them is um, an important role of a parent um, because I think it's really easy to just be ignorant and um, turn a blind eye if you feel like something's weird or suspicious. Um, so please, please, if you sense anything, you know, a mother's instinct, a father's instinct, follow it definitely follow it. And um, I just love you guys. And I hope that you are comfortable with me sharing some of my past with you. Um, because it really is an important thing for me to do in order to be able to truly reveal to you guys who I am and why I am the way I am. And um, I hope it helps you understand me and I just want to understand all of you a little bit better. And that's why I love reading your comments. And I thank you for being a part of the Cal Preach community. And, you know, Jesus Christ is the solution to everything. And he's going to heal me. And he has healed me in so many ways. And I know that he can heal you and he can heal your past and rewrite your story. So God bless you and peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Say peace of Christ, Pokey. Say peace of Christ. Bye.